There's a phrase in the Mangala Sutta, the discourse on blessings. Of course, is that one of the blessings is when your mind is not shaken by the ways of the world. The ways of the world are what? Status, loss of status, material gain, loss, praise, criticism, pleasure, and pain. That's what the world has to offer. And for a lot of people, that seems to be not only what the world has to offer, but what makes them have value as people to the extent to which they can gain merit, material gain, status, praise, and fame, sensual pleasures. But these things come and go. And it's not the case that everybody can have them all at once. If your view of your worth as a person depends on these things, you're setting yourself up for a fall. And the world keeps pushing that idea that this is what's really worthwhile in life. This is what makes you have value as a person, the extent to which you can gain power and wealth and status and whatnot. Yet they do their best to withhold it from you. I'm talking now even about how some people are redundant when artificial intelligence takes over the labor market. People won't have jobs. And they're just excess people of no worth, which is a horrible idea. It's no wonder that the and John's keep contrasting the ways of the world with the ways of the Dharma and saying they're two totally different things, two totally different sets of values. In terms of the Dharma, everybody has worth. And that worth is augmented by things that are in your control. Wealth is not under your control. Status is not under your control. Other people's praise or criticism, you can't control those things. But you can control what you choose to do. This is how your worth is augmented. You can choose to be generous. You can choose to be virtuous. And above all, you can choose to train the mind. This is something you are directly responsible for. And the better the training you give to the mind, the more important you are. There's an interesting Dharma talk by John Mahabhoi that I translated one time. It was one of the few in which he gave a little introduction beforehand, saying that this talk was given to an important monk, one of the important monks of our day and age. When I first read that, I thought he was referring to somebody with an ecclesiastical rank. But then I found out later it was one of the, the Ajahns in the forest tradition, who was not famous at all, but he had a very high level of attainment. In fact, it was as a result of that talk that he was able, apparently, to become an Arahant. That's what makes people important, the extent to which they can cleanse their minds. So when you're meditating, you're asserting your importance as a person. It can be an act of defiance. The world may say that you're worthless. And you see so many young people nowadays committing suicide because the world seems to be telling them that they're worthless, redundant, which is horrible that the, the world has gotten into people's minds so thoroughly. It's time to not let yourself be defeated by the world. And you exert your importance by looking for happiness in ways that are harmless. This is something of inherent value. Wealth doesn't have inherent value, nor does status, nor does praise, nor does sensual pleasures. But generosity has inherent value. Your virtue has inherent value. The development of good qualities in the mind has inherent value. And so you can choose to take part in that. There's a famous thinker in 19th, early 20th century America, William James. He went through a very bad depression when he was young. He wanted to be an artist, and his father did everything he could to prevent that from happening. 
So what happened is James went into a pretty severe depression. Began to wonder if he had any free will, if anybody had any free will. He got himself out of the depression by deciding that his first act of free will would be to choose to believe in free will, that he had the power to choose his actions and to make a difference in his own life. And then building on that, he became a very famous thinker, psychologist, philosopher. So it does require an act of will. And it's important that you believe that you can make a difference in your life by training the mind. This is one of the reasons why, even though the Buddha is not the sort of person to go out and pick fights with people over matters of doctrine, he would go out and challenge people who taught that you had no choice in the present moment, or that the present moment was totally shaped by forces coming in from the past, either actions you've done or the actions of a Creator God or that it was totally random. Those teachings, he said, left people, left people unprotected and bewildered. And bewilderment is our normal state when we're faced with suffering and pain. And those teachings are basically saying there's nothing you can do. If you're suffering right now, there's nothing you can do about it. And the whole point of the Buddhist teachings is, yes, there is something you can do about it. That's what the Four Noble Truths are all about. He wondered what the Buddha would do with teachings that are said in his name nowadays. That you don't do the practice, there's no you there to do the practice. It's just conditions happening. I mean, that defeats any sense of your worth as a person, the worth of your choices. It's very clear that what you choose to do right now, what you choose to focus on, what you choose to think about, which intentions you choose to act on is an important issue. He started Rahula, his son, on the path of the Dharma, but getting him to look at his actions and see the extent to which his actions do have an impact, and trying to make that impact harmless. And that theme carries all the way through. When you're meditating, you're trying to find a happiness that's harmless. And you have to, have to reflect on your actions, how you focus on the breath, how you adjust the breath, how you create sense, a sense of pleasure, a sense of rapture through the way you breathe, how you get to know the way you shape your mind, and then you can shape your mind in ways that gladden it. Concentrate it, release it. This is all within your power. So each of us has an inherent power. We're already shaping our present moment experience. It's just that for most of us, we're doing it in ignorance. And as a result, we suffer. If you can learn how to look at what you're doing and see the extent to which your feelings and your perceptions shape the state of your mind right now. And you can do something about it. And the Buddha says basically you can take it all the way to the ultimate happiness. But if you, even if you don't go that far, the fact that you do decide to be as skillful as you can in how you run your mind, that's taking a huge step right there. So it's important that we not let ourselves be defeated by the world, especially when we say that the leaders of the world don't seem to care about anybody except themselves and their friends. We have to keep reminding ourselves that what other people think about us is not the issue, whether they esteem us or not. What's important and what makes us important is the fact that we take responsibility for our actions. We try to do them as skillfully as we can.
So as you meditate, it's an assertion of your worth in defiance of the world. Think about the forest Johns. They were born, many of them, at the very bottom of the social ladder in Thailand. It was bad enough that there were peasants, but there were peasants in the northeast, and the rest of the country tended to look down on the northeast. And so the fact that they found the Dharma and practiced the Dharma in a way that called into question a lot of the official versions of Dharma that were coming out of Bangkok at the time was very bold. But it was their honesty that guaranteed the truth of what they were doing. Bangkok was saying in those days that not only was Nibbana no longer open, even, you, even John it was unavailable. In spite of the fact that the Buddha said that the drama is timeless, very sophisticated arguments were given to support the official line. But the Forest Johns were not swayed by those arguments. They claimed their right to practice the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. And they shaped themselves to be in line with the Dharma. That was what gave power to their teachings. So the practice of the Dharma in line with the Dharma is a defiant act. We're saying we're not going to be swayed by the ways of the world, what the world has to offer. Because after all, even though the world offers the possibility of material gain and status and praise and sensual pleasures, as that chant we had just now reminds us, the world really offers no shelter. It lures us with these things, but it can't provide us with any real protection. Whereas the Dharma protects all those who practice the Dharma. And there's an inherent worth to the Dharma, and as we turn ourselves into Dharma, we give ourselves a heightened inherent worth. <laughs>